the Lord definitely used you all today. Amen. 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 Ooh, so, here we are. Give yourselves a round of applause. Amen. We do better for that. Y'all don't appreciate yourselves. Most churches, the folks would have played hooky today. Amen. You know, Pastor Johnson made it clear he was out, so I'm grateful y'all here. Amen. 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 There is a word today. Thank you, Jesus. If you have your Bibles, can you please turn to the book of 2 Kings? <laughs> Chapter 2. Their ringing is annoying me. I'm going to have to go back there. We're going to start at verse 19. When you get it, if you can stand to your feet, say amen, amen. amen. It's a custom of our house to stand in reverence to the power and the authority of God's word. And it reads, And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant as my Lord seeth, but the water is not and the ground barren. And he said, bring me a new cruise or a, a tall bowl and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of the waters and cast the salt in there and said, thus saith the Lord. I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. And the word is blessed. Amen. As you take your seats, I want you to look to somebody, look behind you, look in front of you, look around you. And I want you to tell them, we got the ball. <laughs> I know you're looking at me crazy like, what the heck is he talking about? You can be seated. Last week, whether you're a casual fan, an avid fan, most of us watched the Super Bowl. Amen. And we watched a really good team come from behind 21 points in the fourth quarter. And if you're like me, every time the defense made a stop, you got excited because you know we got the ball back. Amen. Do I have some sports fans in the house? Do I have some ex-athletes, some current athletes, some coaches? Do I have some people in here that at one time in their life they have actually thrown a ball or caught a ball? It doesn't matter if you're in the game or in the backyard, there's just something special about the feeling when you get a ball. If we started passing a ball around in this room, it would get the attention of everybody. Amen. That's what a ball does. The ball demands attention. And there is an indescribable feeling once you possess the ball. In team sports, the moment there is a turnover, in the crowd, at home, on the field, the moment there is a turnover, somebody, everybody's yelling, we got the ball. Amen. There's a moment of optimism when we get the ball. Amen. There's a deep sense of relief and excitement when you get the ball. I coached defense last year. My team won the, the, the city championship. It was a great moment for me. And every time we got a stop, especially in the championship game, I walked off the field with my team with, with a, a, a sense of accomplishment. I felt gratified mm -hmm. leaving the field that we did our job and we got the ball. Amen. Why? Because now we get to go on offense. We can dictate the pace of the game. We can put ourselves in a position to score and most importantly, win. Amen. Look at your neighbor and tell them today, today. we on offense. We, on offense. we got the ball. If we go back to the beginning of this chapter, we see Elijah telling Elisha to wait for him three times. 
In verse 2, Elijah tells him to wait here. God has sent me to Bethel. In verse 4, Elijah says, wait here in Bethel. God has sent me to Jericho. And then for the third time in verse 6, Elijah tells him to wait in Jericho, for God has sent me to Jordan. In all three instances, Elijah's response to Elijah was the same. As the Lord lives, and as thy soul lives, I will not leave thee. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to our first point. Stay in position. Amen. Elisha made the 12 mile trip from Bethel to Jericho, which would have taken about a half a day. And then he continued on another five miles to the Jordan because he knew the importance of being in position. He knew the importance of being at his master's feet. If we read more, we see that Elijah even stayed in position knowing, I mean, I mean I'm sorry, we, we see that Elisha stayed in position knowing that Elijah was going to be taken from him. Two times in verse 3 and once in verse 5, the sons of the prophets came to Elisha saying, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And both times Elisha responds, Hold your peace. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you today that we are in a new season of elevation. Amen. And things will be said to you with the sole purpose of making you quit. Yeah. Things will be said to you to make you lose faith. Yeah. Things will be said to you to make you lose hope. Things will be said to you to make you to step out of position only to try and stop you from receiving what God is about to do in your life. But just like Elijah, I'm going to need somebody in here when they hear those things. I'm going to need somebody to respond to those critics. I'm going to need somebody to respond to those haters. I'm going to need somebody to respond to those sons of prophets. Oh, hold your peace. Amen. When you hear them say you ain't qualified, hold your peace. Amen. When you hear them say you will lose, tell them to hold your peace. Amen. When you hear them say you're always going to be in debt, you ain't spiritual enough, tell them to hold your peace. When somebody says you're just not attractive enough, tell them to hold their peace. When they say you're not going to get married, tell them to hold their peace. When your kid, when they say your kids are going to act just like you and they're going to wind up just like you, tell them, er, hold your peace. All the negative and condemning comments, tell them to hold your peace. Because they're only designed to do one thing, get you out of position. Tell somebody, stay in position. Because we got the ball. Continuing on in this story, we see that Elisha, being in position and showing his faithfulness, it gave him the opportunity to make a request to his master, Elijah. You can't ask if you're not here. You can't ask God if you're not in his presence. You can't ask your church if you're not in attendance. In verse 9 it reads, And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elijah said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon thee. Now we got to understand this. Elijah wasn't asking to be two more, two times more powerful than Elijah. He wasn't asking for double of his anointing. That's not what he was doing. He simply was making the request of inheritance due to the firstborn son from a father. In Hebrew custom, the firstborn was due to receive twice as much as the other. And here, Elisha is making his request known that, hey, I see you as my daddy. I've been walking with you. I want my inheritance. We're moving along really fast here. I don't like being up here in front of y'all all day. So for my second point, positioning will determine your inheritance. Because Elijah was in position, he was not only to ask for, but he was also able to receive his inheritance. What do I 
I look like leaving everything to my oldest and he don't even want to be bothered with me. He don't want to come spend time with me. He don't want to call me. What do I look like? That's not the way it has to work. You have to be in a position to receive your inheritance. But not only that, if you are in the position to give an inheritance, you got to be in a position to afford to give it. Because according to Hebrew custom, you had to give twice as much as you had. To make sure that your next generation was set up even better than you. I was at a, a memorial service yesterday and it was so sad because his daughter found out at that moment, two hours before the memorial service, they were having a memorial service. They didn't even know that, that, that he was going to have a memorial service. They, there was no funds left behind. We got to do a better job of making sure that as parents, grandparents, leaders, that we make sure that the people coming up behind us are in a better position than we left it. Hallelujah. You have to be in a position to receive. You have to be in a position to receive your inheritance, to receive your blessing. You have to be in a position to receive your breakthrough. You have to be in a position to receive your healing. Put yours there. You have to be in a position to receive. Amen. I love football. I love football. Quarterback just don't throw the ball anywhere. He throw the ball to a specific spot on the field, and the wide receiver has the obligation to get there no matter what opposition in order to receive the ball. Same thing for basketball. We watch LeBron. LeBron knows where his teammates are at because they have designated spots on the floor where they're supposed to be. He drives and he can make a no-look pass because his teammates are in position to receive the ball. So now, here we are. We got the ball. Elijah stayed in position. He asked for the rightful firstborn inheritance from Elijah. He sees the chariots of fire and the horses of fire come and take Elijah up and away in a whirlwind into heaven. Elijah cries out, tears his own clothes off into two, the Bible says. And lo and behold, he sees that his master's mantle was left behind. He grabs the mantle, strikes the Jordan, calls on the God of Elijah and says, Hey, the God of Elijah come down, he strikes it, and the water parted just like it did for Elijah. And Elisha walks across. Now these 50 sons of prophets, the negative folks, I'm going to start calling all the negative, condemning people that I come across sons of prophets. Come on. <laughs> These 50 sons of prophets had followed Elijah and Elisha to the Jordan to watch from afar. These are also the same sons of prophets that tormented Elijah by reiterating that he was going to lose his master this day. So these hating sons of prophets see Elisha. That's where y'all mind is. They see Elisha part the water and run up to him. They bow down proclaiming that the spirit of Elijah rests on him. Why is it that we almost have to perform miracles in order for the people of God to see the God in us? It shouldn't have to be that hard. We got to do tricks, we got to perform, we got to turn water into wine just for people to recognize that God is in us. And these were religious folks at that. I want to let y'all know we can't always worry about the crowd. The fans in the stands got the most to say about the players on the field. While they up in the nosebleed spectating, stay in position and give them something to watch. They paid to be all the way up there while we getting paid to be on the field putting in work. We got the ball. The word of Elisha mm -hmm. split the Jordan made its way to Jericho. Mm -hmm. Most likely the 50 SOPs that had now become fans, <laughs> sons of prophets. <laughs> <laughs> they had become fans
hands, most likely they spread the word to Jericho. Jer uh, Elisha was waiting in Jericho. These sons of prophets, they come to Elisha and they say, hey, let us go find Elijah. Instead of him wasting his time and telling them, no, he gone, he let them go ahead and do what they do and he allowed God to show them better than he could tell them. That's for somebody in here. Some arguments ain't even worth arguing. Some confrontations ain't even worth having. Sometimes you just gotta say, go ahead, I'm gonna go on over here and wait. So he waited in Jericho. And the men of the city, they heard from the sons of prophets that Elijah had, uh, Elisha had the power of Elijah. And they find Elisha and they come to him and they tell him that their city is beautiful. They say it's a good situation here. We got nice weather, great scenery, palm trees, bushes that let off a sweet smell. The air in Jericho has smelled sweet. But our water is bad and the ground is barren. Come on. Now that didn't mean that nothing would grow. The word barren means causing to miscarry. Ooh. Things would grow in Jericho. Yeah. Seeds were planted. Plants and trees would grow. Vine yards would bud and blossom. But the fruit would not develop, and if it did, before it got ripe, it would fall from the tree. Right. Come on, come on, come on. The water was not. It means worthless. Mm -hmm. The problem wasn't so much that the ground was bad, but that the streams flowing from the city had brought death and fruitlessness. Come on. Come on now. Teach us. It resulted in barrenness. The historian Josephus states that this, this problem extended to livestock and people as well. Trees wouldn't produce fruit. Livestock was miscarrying. Humans were miscarrying. All because of this stream of worthless water. The water was not and it brought death instead of life. I asked myself why. Why? Why? There has to be an answer. Joshua 6.26 This is after the Israelites walk around the city seven times. This is after they blew the shofar. After they lost their mind and screamed and the walls fell down. After they took the city and destroyed it. It reads, then Joshua charged them at the time saying, cursed be the man before the Lord who rises up and builds this city Jericho. He shall lay its foundation with his firstborn and with his youngest he shall set up the, its gates. The people of Jericho were dealing with the curse from generations ago and didn't even know it. Because things appeared good, the weather was nice, the palm trees were pretty. The shrubs made it smell nice. They had nice buildings and nice architecture. The situation was pleasant, and they didn't even realize they were dealing with a generational curse. My third point, don't be the guy on the field or on the court with all the accessories and can't produce nothing. Come on, we, we've all seen that brother with the headband, he at the court. He got the Jordan jersey on with the matching bulls shorts. He got the, the, the leggings on, the compression pants. He got the, the, the long sleeve on. He got the, the, type, the, the tattoos. He got the hoop earrings just like Mike. But then he go to shoot the ball and his form is off. He can't run. He out of shape. He can't make a shot. Just can't play a lick. He got all the accessories. He looked good. Come on. But can't produce nothing. I go through this every year at football. Every year. Kid come, he got every accessory. Accessories I've never seen before. He got forearm pads, elbow pads, gloves. He got the visor. He's seven. Why he need a visor? 
gloves at seven. We don't even throw the ball. He got gloves. Receivers gloves. Wristbands, eye black, hand warmers, every accessory and still won't even tackle a bag. You know the big bag that you put out there and they won't even tackle it, scared to death, but got every accessory. They look good, but ain't producing anything. Honestly, I love them, but at that moment, they just on the roster taking up space. Come on. Come on, Come on, Pete. Some of us look good. We seem pleasant. We speak the Christian language. Y'all know the buzzwords. The new one is posture. That's the new Christian buzzword. Posture. We know the words. We know what to say. We know how to act. We know how to dress. We're well versed in the word. We pray. We tithe. We give. We try our best to do our part. We look the part. And yet we can't seem to figure out why we are not producing fruit. I asked the Lord, why did I have to preach this? Normally I get up here and I preach a good promise field. God is going to do it for you because that wasn't my <laughs> office. And now he got me preaching this. Come on. Why aren't we producing life? Come on. Just, like the Jer just like Jericho, the streams flowing from some of us are stale and bringing death because of generational curses. It wasn't the man's fault that came to Elisha. It wasn't their fault. The inhabitants of Jericho, they had nothing to do with it. It happened generations before them. And yet here they were dealing with the mess from their forefathers. Their sin. It was clear. Don't build here. Some SOP decided he was going to build there. <laughs> and now they ain't dealing with the generational curse from their forefathers. And here we are, dealing with the generational issues from our parents, and grandparents, and great-grandparents, and so on. Generational curses of divorce, generational court curses of singleness, generational curses of domestic violence, Generational curses of mental health issues. Generational curses of poverty and lack. Generational curses of laziness and no ambition. Generational curses of addiction. Generational curses of bondage and incar incarceration. Generational curses of sexual immorality. Generational curses of anger and wrath. Generational curses polluting the streams flowing from us. And it's causing barrenness in our ministries. Causing barrenness in our families. Causing barrenness in our marriages. Our finances. It's causing barrenness in our business plans. It's causing barrenness in our nonprofits. It's causing barrenness in our children. In our careers. In our churches. And it's causing barrenness in our faith. But we look good. But we look good. I was on my way to work Monday morning. I had thought that I was going to preach on compassion for the last couple of weeks. I did. I thought I was going to preach on compassion. And the Lord Monday said, no, that's not it. Confirmed it Wednesday when we came to Bible study and Deacon Kenny preached on compassion. <laughs> Monday morning, I'm riding to work, and I hear him say, we got the ball. He said, it's time to be on the offense and attack the very things plaguing his people. The ball we're talking about is the Holy Spirit that's in us. That's the ball. No more defensive saints waiting to defend when the enemy attacks. Come on, come on. We got the Holy Spirit. Come on, come on. It's time for us to be on the offensive. Come on. It's time for us to make the next move. It's time for us to dictate the pace of the game. Let's stop waiting to be punched and punch. Let's stop waiting to react. Let's be the first one. Let's be the, 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 the church. Let's be the body that initiates contact. I love football. I love it. I told you that before. I keep saying that. I love this. I just love it. Yes, I was a receiver, brother. I couldn't play basketball. I couldn't jump. My mom was white. I played football. I was fast. 
to what time? <laughs> but in football, the person who is advancing the ball, if he is scared of contact, he is going to lose the battle. Nine times out of ten, the person that initiates contact wins that situation. It is time for us to initiate contact. It is time for us to go to the source of these generational curses and bring the bring it. We're going to bring it. We're going to pop it. Amen? Amen. I wasn't going to be here long. Let's stand up. Let's stand up. Elisha, he used two things, two things to destroy that generational curse. An act of faith and the word of God. An act of faith and the word of God. If we look at Elisha's ministry, we see God telling him or instructing him to do things that made absolutely no sense. But he wanted an act of faith from Elisha. Putting water in a stream that's flowing in a bowl of salt. Or putting salt in a stream that's flowing is not going to clean water. It's not. It had nothing to do with the salt. It was his act of faith. It was his act of faith and the word of God that destroyed the generational curse. An act of faith and the word of God that destroyed the generational curse. Some of y'all need to change your phone numbers. Some of y'all need to cancel your social media pages. Some of y'all need to present an act of faith to God showing him, yeah, this time I mean business. I'm tired of my children suffering. I'm tired of my church suffering. I'm tired of suffering because of the generational curses. Yes, it's not fair. Yes, it's not fair. In most cases, you have nothing to do with it. It's the sins of your grandparents, your great-great-grandparents. But unfortunately, you are here and you are left to deal with it. So we either going to keep on faking it like till we make it look good and not produce fruit. Or we going to bring the contact today. We can all just close our eyes. Yes, God. this day. We thank you for this moment, Lord. We thank you for this appointment, Lord Jesus. I ask you right now, Lord God, for your spirit of discernment to fall on everyone in this place, Lord Jesus. Allow us to properly diagnose ourselves in our own situations. Do not let us be deceived by the things that appear good in our life, Father. Don't let us be deceived by our own knowledge. Don't let us be deceived by our past victories, Lord. Don't let us be deceived by our elevation in this season, Lord. Allow us to properly diagnose the streams flowing from us in this moment, Lord. Allow us to see whether it's barren or fruitful. I ask you right now, Lord Jesus, that you touch the hearts of your people, Lord God. That you prepare them right now in this moment to do a miraculous thing, Lord. We speak in the name of Jesus. Deliverance in this place today. We command your Holy Spirit to come in this place today, Father God. Meet us right now, Lord Jesus. As we step out on faith, Father God. As we step out on faith, Father God, we hold to the power of your word that the streams are healed. That the streams are healed, Father God. The streams are healed, Father God. And no barrenness or death shall come from them anymore, Father God. We thank you, Lord Jesus. 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 We thank you for fruitfulness. We thank you for life, Father God. We thank you for streams of living water flowing from us, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the ministries and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the businesses that will flow and be fruitful from this place, Lord God. We thank you for meeting us in this appointed moment, Lord Jesus. 
I ask right now, Lord God, that you continue to work, Lord. And as we continue, as we conclude this prayer, Lord, I ask right now, Lord, that you strengthen the faith of your people. Strengthen the faith of your people that they may make that first step in an act of faith, Lord. Yes. Meet them. Yes. As they take one step towards you, Lord, I ask that you take ten steps toward them. Meet them in this place today, Lord. Meet them in this place today, Lord. I add, decree and declare that lives will be changed once they leave this place today, Lord. I decree and declare abundance and fruitfulness when we leave this place today, Lord. Somebody in here, he's saying, go back to school. That is your act of faith. If that's you today, your first act of faith is to come to this altar today. And we will decree the word of God over you. Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from this day any more death or barren land. There shall not be from this day any more death or barren land. Hallelujah. 